code. And I've now paused, hitting the record button, and I'm admitting all. Okay, uh, they're all in, and I'm going to mute myself now. Okay, it looks like Marcus started recording. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone who's uh, who's joining us at whatever time this this might be for you. Um, I've uh, I've been excited to to watch these talks over the recent uh, quite a few weeks. Um, for for those folks, if there are any signing in for the first time. Um, I believe the series was put together to highlight some of the particularly interesting science about to be published in the different SCB journals uh, and work I think that's especially innovative and, and timely. Um, just a couple points uh, at the outset. Um, for, for those of you here in the meeting, uh, just please, if you don't mind, set mute to on and your video to off uh, during the talk. Um, and we'll do questions at the end. Um, so feel free to either drop a question into the chat and I'll take a look at those and feed them to Anastasia. Um, or if you're more comfortable or can't manage the chat, you can raise your little Zoom hand. That's okay too. Uh, we'll just sort of feel it out. Um, I get, oh, I guess I should say, my name is, uh, is John Salerno. I, uh, I started talking with Mark Schwartz, uh, the editor of Conservation of Science and Practice, um, about a, a special issue on community-based conservation. Wow, um, it's probably been well over a year now. And uh, the, the goal of the issue specifically was to solicit papers on the, the adaptation and evolution of institutions and governance related to community-based conservation. And, uh, and that's how I first interacted with Dr. Anastasia Quintana, uh, who, who sent us one of the most interesting abstracts, if I remember correctly. Uh, and it, it resulted in one of my favorite papers uh, in, in the issue. And specifically, uh, you'll hear all about the, the, the paper and, and the work around it, but, but the paper itself highlights these two important themes that, that emerged from the contributions to the special issue. Uh, and one of those was that the, the multi-level structure of uh, institutions and governance arrangements uh, is, is really necessary for understanding how communities adapt to various constraints and opportunities. Um, and then two, it's, it's also really important to consider agency and to allow for people and institutions to be adaptive actors within, uh, within the larger system. Uh, and so, uh, Anastasia, you can correct me if I have the, the timing a little bit wrong, um, but, but you recently finished your PhD in marine science and conservation at Duke University. And you're currently a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow based at the University of, or University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and, uh, and Anastasia's work broadly looks at understanding collective action in small scale fisheries. Uh, and specifically how policies can potentially incentivize collective action where uh, community or fisher-based management institutions uh, are not actively uh, or already in place. Um, but I think we're gonna hear more about that. Uh, and so I'll stop talking now and hand it over to Dr. Quintana. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, John. Um... Yeah, it's, I'm glad you found those aspects interesting of the paper. I totally encourage everyone to read the paper. It's open access um, because I'm not going to totally dive into that interesting paradox of community-based management that it works best when it's not just community-based management. Um, and actually it has these multi-level connections to NGOs and higher levels of like state and national uh, government. But as John said, so can everyone see and hear me well, first of all? Um, I'm going to assume that not saying no is a yes. So um, I have two things before I start. I developed a cough yesterday, so I apologize in advance if I have to turn away for a minute uh, to clear my throat. And uh, also I'm still 
learning the Zoom platform. So bear with me, please. As John said, my name is Anastasia Quintana and um, I'm a postdoc based at UCSD right now. And I'm an environmental social scientist. I study collective action. And that's basically how people work together to solve environmental problems. And before I dive into this talk, um, particularly given conservation's racist and colonial roots, I would like to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of the land where I'm currently giving this talk. Um, and I would also like to pay respect to elders, both past and present, as well as other indigenous people listening to the seminar live or to the recorded talk. I'd also like to acknowledge the participants, the funders, and the collaborators that enabled this research to take place, including the Fishers of the Corridor, who are my respondents, as well as the NGOs Niparaja and Kobe, the National Science Foundation, and the Forum for Scholars and Publics at Duke University. And as John said, uh, today I'll be presenting a paper by myself and Javier Basurto at Duke University, recently published or in press at Conservation Science and Practice. And this is based on a chapter from my PhD dissertation. As I mentioned, open access. So if you're interested in these ideas, I encourage you to read and share this paper. Um, given the hazards of the online format, in case your kid or lunch calls you away, I'm gonna spoil the end of the story right away. Uh, based on lessons from Mexico, in conversation with theory, three community-based or bottom-up pathways to end open access are through insecure property rights, informal property rights, and property rights regime shifts. That is, in places where overuse and resource decline is attributed to open access, giving resource users insecure property rights may create low stakes trust building opportunities. And where legal pathways fail, resource users can appropriate informal property rights, especially management and exclusion rights, and finally, managers and resource users should aim for larger property rights regime shifts rather than piecemeal interventions. Um, now, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to explain what I mean by all this. I'm going to start really broadly with the challenges of fisheries management. Um, then I'm going to zip through some property rights theory. I'll briefly explain the methods I used. I'll explain what happened in this case, and I'll conclude with some lessons. So. Why is it interesting to study conservation issues in the context of small scale fisheries? Well, first of all, everyone knows that fisheries are hard to manage. And often fisheries management starts from this doom and gloom message of overfishing and collapse. For example, in this 2002 paper published in Nature, it, the abstract starts out with fisheries have rarely been sustainable. Uh, and these are newspaper headlines following a paper published in 2006 in Science which included one model predicting 100% collapse of major fish stocks by 2048. Now, these particular predictions are very contested, but these messages of increasingly unsustainable fisheries are supported by global statistics. So this is um, a graph from the United Nations FAO using global data to 2015, showing that the sustainability of stocks has steadily declined to present day. On the top, we have overfished stocks steadily increasing, we have underfish stocks steadily decreasing. And all these statistics contribute to a doom and gloom narrative for fisheries. However, all this gets even more interesting when we separate industrial and small scale fisheries. Um, in industrial fisheries, there's evidence that many stocks are being harvested around sustainable levels. For example, in this paper published this year by Ray Hilborn and others in PNAS, um, and it, from a governance perspective, top-down, state-led, command and control management is increasingly effective in industrial fisheries. There's widespread tracking of boats at sea. These big boats often land their catch at big ports and sell directly to fish distributors, which makes it much easier to enforce regulations at ports. And there's certainly a lot of issues in industrial fishing, but it's relatively easier to monitor and enforce. However, only about half of the wild caught fish eaten on the planet is caught by industrial fisheries. The other half is caught by small scale fisheries. And a lot of recent work has found that the stock status of small scale fisheries is far worse than those of industrial fisheries. And this is a huge problem because almost everybody who fishes is a small scale fisher. The livelihoods of about 200 million people 
depend on small scale fishing, including fish processing and people up the value chain, which means that when small scale fisheries collapse, it hurts a lot of people. And so why do small scale fisheries seem to be in worse shape globally than industrial fisheries? Well, they're mega diverse in terms of what they catch, but also how and who and why. Um, they're often fishing for a diversity of reasons, not just income, but culture, freedom, food security, which means that they respond heterogeneously to incentives. And it's hard to even define them. They're usually defined according to boat size, say less than 12 meters long, um, but this includes everything from a woman gleaning shellfish from the shore in Mexico to relatively high efficiency gill netting of salmon in Alaska. And it also involves a lot of different actors, fishers and their families, but also buyers, middlemen, processors, and all these people that go beyond fishers on boats taking out fish. And this huge diversity of types of fishing and reasons for fishing is spread all across the globe. And in contrast to industrial fisheries, small scale fisheries are often poorly managed by central governments. And so top down centralized management faces challenges because small scale fisheries are disproportionately located in places that are far from administrative centers where there might be high corruption and there might be little money in enforcement. And to illustrate that, um, in the box is the state of Baja California Sur and it's the site of my dissertation research. And it has a 2,000 kilometer coastline, which is longer than the coast of California. And someone once told me that there's only two full-time officials who are monitoring fishing in that entire coastline. And you can imagine the effectiveness of top-down fisheries management when there's only two officials for 2,000 kilometers. And so to summarize, top-down government-led management is largely ineffective at managing small-scale fisheries, with stock status seeming to go down around the world, particularly in places like Mexico. And if you're finding it hard to connect to small scale fisheries, remember next time you go buy fish at the store, a person caught that fish. And there's a pretty good chance that the fish you're buying was caught by someone on a small boat whose livelihood completely depends on the health of their local marine ecosystem. Now, given the mediocre success of top-down management at sustaining small scale fisheries, are small scale fisheries doomed? Well, I mean, you might've guessed, um, one alternative is collective action or bottom-up management by the resource users themselves. And the need for top-down control in the first place is premised upon the assumption that resource users cannot or will not manage their own resources sustainably in the absence of the rule of law. But it turns out that this assumption is sometimes wrong. Um, collective action among natural resource users has been extensively studied in a body of scholarship called common pool resource theory which is the framing that uh, informs the bulk of my research. And today I'm not gonna really go into details of common pool resource theory, but I'm just gonna point out that it examines what happens when resource users have control over their own resources, particularly those resources that are commons. And here I'm defining commons as resources that are collectively harvested with no private property rights, like forests, uh, fisheries, and collective pastures. Now, open access commons are resources with no restrictions on who can harvest. And a lot of early thinking in common pool resource theory predicted inevitable collapse of commons without state control or market solutions. And this was because of perverse incentives associated with open access resource systems. However, there's a lot of new evidence, uh, actually old at this point, that resource users often manage uh, resources sustainably when they have resource, uh, control over their resources especially by developing and enforcing their own rules. That is, the resource users themselves often transform their system away from open access. And one of the biggest contributions of common pool resource theory has been identifying the characteristics associated with the emergence of, of successful self-management. And these include like high spatial variability of the resource and group stability of the resource users. And in systems with these characteristics, there's a higher likelihood that users will spontaneously end open access. But what about when these characteristics are absent? That is, what about in places where theory does not predict the spontaneous emergence of collective action? Are there strategies for resource users to end open access, possibly through policy interventions or policy opportunities? And this brings us to property rights theory. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm gonna depart for a minute from conservation and let's do a quick thought exercise. So let's say you go to the store and buy a cake and bring it home. Think for a second about what rights you have to that cake. So you can look at the cake, you can eat it, you can make rules about when your kids can eat it, uh, and you could even sell the cake to your neighbor. Now, but let's imagine you're at a party and there's a cake there. What rights do you have to the cake now? So you can certainly look at it and you can eat it, but maybe you can't eat the whole thing. And it would be pretty rude to tell the other guests when they can eat the cake. And it would be pretty shocking if you tried to sell that cake to the neighbor. And in fact, there's actually complex rights that you have, as well as roles and responsibilities towards resources in different contexts. And one theoretical tool to arrange, uh, to organize this complexity is the concept of property rights. And for now, let's define property rights as rights to derive benefits from a resource. And the reason they're considered important is because they determine who captures what benefits, which generates incentives, which can influence behavior. And a lot of people might think of property rights in terms of private property, which is pretty familiar, as having or not having a thing. But as far as the commons go, if you think back to the example of the cake, there are many other important rights. And these different property rights are often compared to a bundle of sticks with different types of users possessing different configurations or bundles of property rights. And there's four types of rights that are really considered important for the commons. Access is the right to enter commons, so look at the cake. Withdrawal is the right to harvest, eat the cake. Management is the right to make decisions that improve the resource, make rules about when and who can eat the cake. And exclusion is the right to determine who has withdrawal rights. So that's making rules about who can make rules about eating the cake. And these rights can be granted by law, legal or formal rights, or they can be rights exercised in practice, for example, through social norms, um, and these are informal or de facto rights, as in the case with the cake at the party. Now, with property rights, the devil is in the details. So the configuration of these four rights can create different uh, incentives for sustainable or unsustainable behavior. For example, what we might think of as open access is characterized by widespread access and withdrawal rights and little exercise of management or exclusion rights. On the other hand, in a lot of the famous cases of sustainable commons, you can think lobster fishers in Maine, water temples in Bali, the resource users themselves have had long-term and secure management and exclusion rights. But these cases of secure long-term property rights are not the norm in small-scale fishing. And in many cases, it may be challenging for resource users to gain these legal, long-term secure rights because of government inefficacy or corruption or conflict or apathy or a number of different reasons. And so how then are fishers currently operating in open access conditions to transform their property rights regime and gain management and exclusion rights? And to answer this question, I'm gonna draw on some lessons from my in-depth qualitative research on Mexico's fish refuges in Baja California Sur. And so um, Mexico has been called one of the world's biggest small scale fisheries in terms of income and employment. And this red X here uh, is, uh, is it marks a region called the corridor, a region that depends almost entirely on fishing, but where fishing is in decline. And this red X is shown in a little more detail here. Uh, this region includes 13 small fishing towns and there's less than a thousand residents in this area. And like I said, people depend almost entirely on fishing for income. There's a little bit of ranching and a little bit of tourism. And also, as I mentioned, the fishers have noticed that fishing is in decline. In the late 2000s, uh, a, a conservation NGO called Niparaja started working in the corridor. Now, Niparaja is a big and diverse organization dedicated to conservation of Baja California Sur generally, 
but Niparaja's sustainable fisheries program is specifically dedicated to supporting sustainable fisheries through social interventions. And they're a really important player in the story I'm going to talk about today. And Javier, my co-author, and members of his lab have been collaborating with Niparaja since the late 2000s. Starting in 2009, Niparaja's sustainable fisheries program conducted a series of data collection efforts, both social and ecological, in the corridor. Now, the main drama of the story is the establishment of the fish refuges. In an effort to curb fisheries decline, in 2012, 11 temporary and small no-take zones, totaling just 13 square kilometers, were established in the corridor. And it seemed a lot like successful collective action among fishers and also with the government and NGO staff. These fish refuges were designed by fishers, they were legalized by the government, and they were established in a place where some of those characteristics associated with the emergence of collective action were, that I talked about earlier were absent. And then in 2017, they were expanded five times, now totaling 70 kilometers squared, and are showing small but significant ecological benefits to the size and biomass of top commercial species. So this is seemingly a successful emergence of collective action for sustainable management, and I wanted to understand how. So for this study, from 2016 to 2018, I tried to understand how and why different stakeholders decided to establish fish refuges in the corridor. And this included time in the communities, living in the largest town, Agua Verde, for two months. I also lived in the capital, La Paz, for several months to interview uh, Niparaja, the NGO, and government staff. I spent 10 days on a liveaboard boat accompanying the ecological crews to assess the fish refuges. And um, this is a picture of where I lived in Agua Verde. My qualitative data was contextualized in quantitative data collected by Niparaja. And as I mentioned before, um, they conducted focus groups in 2009. They conducted two social science surveys, one in 2009 before the fish refuges were implemented, and one in 2016 towards the end of their first five-year cycle. They also conducted in-water ecological surveys from 2012 to present, and they've been collecting fisheries dependent data from 2012 to present. Data analysis uh, consisted of extensive daily field notes and reflections, uh, preliminary identification of themes and following up on leads with respondents, and of course, upon return, transcription and translation of my interviews, thematic coding and writing. And I wanna draw your attention to two sources of bias in this work. First, the bulk of my field work was conducted in Agua Verde. It's the biggest town by far, and almost half of the residents uh, in the corridor live in this one town. But there's evidence that this town is not like the towns to the south. There's some characteristics that make collective action easier in this town, for example, the biggest fishing cooperative are there. Uh, in 2012, they proposed the biggest, biggest fish refuge. And in 2017, they were the only town to expand and add a new one. So um, any messages of success that I present are largely based on the most successful case in this region. Also, a second source of bias is that Niparaja contributed substantially to data collection. They provided all the quantitative data that I'm gonna present. Uh, and they also provided introductions and brought me into the corridor. And this, of course, introduced the possibility that the people I interviewed would bias their answers in favor of Niparaja or in favor of the fish refuges. To reduce this bias, I developed my own rapport once there, and I emphasized that I was a student and that my interviews were confidential. Also, I rented a separate house from the Niparaja house in Agua Verde. However, I think it's really important to understand these sources of bias to interpret the findings I'm gonna present. So, what did I find? In summary, before the fish refuges, there was a situation which might be familiar to people working in small scale fisheries. There was widespread access and withdrawal and evidence of fisheries decline, the things we associate with overfishing. There was some attempt at management and exclusion by the corridor fishers, but this was not recognized by the state or by outside fishers. Now, through the process of establishing and enforcing the fish refuges, there was a reduction in 
illegal access and withdrawal by outsiders and an increase in legal access by corridor fishers. There's greater management occurring on a legal level and the corridor fishers have gained both de facto management rights and de facto exclusion rights. And the reason that they have been able to gain these rights is precisely because the rights are informal and insecure. And this is what Javier and I have called a property rights regime change. And it has been driven by demand from fishers organized and facilitated by an NGO. Now I'm gonna walk through all this in more detail. Um, before the fish refuges, and this is circa 2009, Niparaha conducted focus groups, as I mentioned, in every town to understand fishers' perceptions of their fisheries. And the fishers reported three major problems, all centered on property rights in one form or another. And as you'll see later on, this incentivized fishers' agreement to respect the no-take zones that they would eventually create. And it motivated their efforts to get them established once the government was delaying the proposal. Um, one of the major problems essentially was open access conditions. So this here on the right is a map of the corridor. And this is a map of the fishing areas of each town within the corridor. Each town has its own colored fishing area. And what I want you to get from this is not the specifics, but rather that there's lots of overlap. But despite the fact that there's lots of overlap, between these towns, there was large, largely agreement about management. They have this term in the corridor called pescar bien, which means fishing well. And there's some variability with what that means, but the commonalities were that they more or less agreed that one should hook, fish with hook and line, which is a low efficiency gear. In the north, they avoided, avoided nets altogether, or, and uh, throughout the corridor, they would avoid setting nets over rocky bottoms. They would respect each other's baited zones, and they would respect each other's fishing areas. And all this served to reduce fishing effort locally, essentially exercising informal fisheries management. However, while this informal management rights were recognized within the corridor, they were not recognized by outsiders. And this is one of the problems of informal management. And the outsiders who didn't respect these rules included a bunch of different groups, mostly semi-legal with overlapping harvest rights. First, fishers from a town to the north had obtained a fancy exclusive management permit called an UMA, uh, which is governed by a different agency. And this gave them exclusive rights to dive for sea cucumber in the red shaded area. Fishers from the corridor claimed that the sea cucumber was actually a cover story and that these fishers would essentially catch anything they found while diving with hookah or a compressor um, using a spear gun which is a really high efficiency gear that is illegal for commercial fishing across Mexico. Now in the South, some, some permit idiosyncrasies gave some of the urban fishers from, the city, from La Paz, the capitals of the South, it gave them access to harvest anywhere within the municipality of La Paz, which includes the Southern Corridor. And the corridor fishers accused them of using damaging gear and fishing in their traditional areas. Now overlapping this entire region uh, are shrimp trawlers and migrant fishers. The shrimp trawlers have permits to the entire state uh, a certain distance from the shore, but have been accused of fishing too close to the shore or fishing with nets of too small a mesh size. And migrant fishers from states across the Gulf of California frequently fished in this region by establishing temporary fishing camps and legalizing their catch with local fish buyers. Um, one moment while I clear my throat and I mute myself. Now, a lot of these overlapping harvesting activities were semi-legal or illegal. And what I'm trying to show is that there's overlapping permits and confusion to fish in this area, resulting in over access and over harvest. Now, at the same time, only about half of the corridor fishers had legal fishing permits. Now this didn't stop them from landing catch, but it led to them feeling like delinquents. And also the corridor fishers felt that when the authorities came to the area, which was rare but occurred, they apprehended the technically illegal corridor fishers fishing with hook and line, rather than the divers and net fishers who they perceived to be doing the real damage to the fishery. And because of all this, 
the fishers of the corridor perceived a classic tragedy of the commons. And Javier and I have characterized this as a top heavy property rights structure. Now, the fishers of the corridor were dissatisfied. Uh, this information is primarily comes from Niparaja's socioeconomic survey of fishers in 2009. And the fishers reported wanting less withdrawal by industrial shrimp trawlers and by outsiders. They wanted more legal access because they lacked permits. Like I said, they felt like delinquents, even though they had fished in the region since the early 1900s. And they also felt that the government punished the traditional fishers of the area rather than those perceived to actually lead to the decline in fisheries. And they actively wanted more management and more exclusion. Now, Nipraha saw opportunity in the fish refuges. Fish refuges uh, presented an opportunity because they engaged with global debates about marine protected areas and marine reserves. And there was also political will in the government to establish them. Um, they are essentially small no-take zones that are temporary. Also, fish the fisheries agency was interested in more fisher participation. Finally, 79% of the fishers in this 2009 survey reported that they would implement, monitor, and enforce no-take zones, demonstrating fisher interest. And so, um, and so this was the opportunity of the fish refuges. Now, fish refuges on their own do not necessarily change property rights. Legally, fishers submit, uh, the process is this. Fishers submit a proposal for no-take zones, and the government fisheries scientists, in this case called INAPESCA, evaluate the proposal. The fisheries agency, called CONAPESCA, makes a decision on whether or not to implement the areas. And then if they decide to implement them, they're implemented for usually five years. Now, this should not change property rights because while the fishers legally propose the area, the right to manage and exclude legally still lies with the government. So nothing has changed. But in practice, the process of establishing fish refuges in the corridor has transformed the property rights structure. In the case of the corridor, the fishers, uh, it has to do with the way they're established. In the case of the corridor, the fishers designed the fish refuges, but the agency had no ability to evaluate it. And because of this, and because of political pressure, they approved the areas exactly as the fishers had proposed them. And so the fishers design was directly translated into management. So in the corridor, there was an extensive series of meetings in the spring of 2010, facilitated by Nipraha about establishing no-take zones. And at first, some people were suspicious, but others reported, it was like a light bulb went off. It will be like a natural nursery for fish. So some people proposed initial maps, others adjusted them, and eventually each town proposed fish refuges in their fishing areas. Eventually, across the whole corridor, they arrived at majority support for a single map. And this map became the proposal. Now, a big incentive to participate in this process was a parallel process of receiving permits. I mentioned that only about half of the fisher of the quarters of the fisher had permits in 2009. Now at the same time as they were designing fish refuges, they were invited by the government to apply for fishing permits. Still, from my interviews, I got the feeling that some people never really engaged in these meetings. They didn't take the time to do management, which they didn't see as their responsibility. And so ultimately, they felt excluded when the final fish refuge map was approved and that when they can no longer fish in the fish refuges. And that's the hard thing about management. It's not just the right to sit at the table, but the fact that you actually do sit, uh, take a seat and put in the time. So the map generated by the fishers was then supported by a long justification document created by Nipraha. And all this was sent to INAPESCA, the fisheries research agency for its technical opinion. And that's when it looked like the proposal would die. The proposal sat with Ina Pesca for two years. And Ina, Pas Ina Pesca staff told me they didn't have any methodology or tools to evaluate fish refuges. And this meant they couldn't evaluate the fisher's design. Over those two years, there was lots of political pressure from Niparaja and from fishers of the corridor who visited the central fisheries office 
in another state to ask about the status of their proposal. And at the same time, uh, within INAPESCA, there was interest in supporting fisher participation. And so, for example, uh, these quotations are for INAPESCA staff. Since the beginning, uh, since the beginning, the fishers agreed with having the fish refuges, and this influenced INAPESCA's decision a lot to give a positive decision. Now, because of this, INAPESCA finally gave what it called a positive technical opinion. What they actually said was they couldn't prove that the fish refuges wouldn't work. Quanapesca then approved the fish refuges and they became law. So this is a map of the original fish refuges established in 2012. The white is land, the blue is water, and these orange squares are the fish refuges. Uh, as I said, the corridor fishers design was directly translated to management. And so in 2012, when the, fishers were, uh, when the fish refuges were passed, the fishers ended up giving up legal access and withdrawal rights inside, but they gained de facto management and exclusion rights to the broader region, as well as gaining legal fishing rights permits to the broader region. So after the fish refuges, there's a new distribution of rights. There's less withdrawal um, because uh, now that the fisher, the corridor fishers have legal permits, they feel comfortable calling the enforcement officers. There's also now a network of camera traps intended to catch illegal activity in the fish refuges, but also serving to catch illegal activity in the broader region. Finally, two fishing cooperatives have collaborated to buy and man an enforcement boat that makes regular patrols of the fish refuges and the broader zone. And going back to the map I showed you earlier, we can visualize this as a reduction in the semi-legal fishing by shrimp boats, migrant fishers, and sea cucumber divers due to the increased enforcement presence and the existence of the small no-take areas. Um, although the La Paz fishers largely still continue to fish, mostly legally, in the Southern Corridor. There is evidence of reduced fishing within the fish refuges, and as I said, there's also evidence of ecological recovery, although um, the fish refuges do not technically apply to the sea cucumber divers, since their permit is managed by a different agency, and so that continues to be a cause of conflict. Also since the establishment of the fish refuges, there is more management occurring in the corridor. The design of the no-take zones, of course, is one example aimed at rebuilding fish stocks, but there's also, the, has been, the, there's also been the establishment of a corridor-wide fisher council with seats held by elected corridor fishers as well as members of the government fisheries agency. And finally, there's also more exclusion. The corridor fishers effectively excluded other fishers from the process of decision-making. And this was a function of where the meetings were held in the corridor and who was at the table, the corridor fishers. And these expanded informal management and exclusion rights have actually been defended by Konopaska. In 2013, there was an explosion in La Paz. Um, the urban fishers were really mad about the existence of the fish refuges and said they had never been consulted, which was true. The Konopeska, uh, however, Konopeska supported the fish refuges, citing historic cache records and saying that there were no records of La Paz fishers landing catch in the corridor and thus they did not need to be consulted. Ironically, many of the fishers of the corridor had also never landed catch, but this was, argument was not used to exclude them. So um, this is a picture of the enforcement boat on the left, and on the right, it's an example of a management meeting by fishers of the corridor. So analyzing all these changes, we argue that the property rights regime has shifted. Before, it was more top heavy, and now, it's more balanced. There are more incentives to make rules for the fishers of the corridor. Now, the key takeaways of this paper, I'd posed the question earlier, how can fishers move from open access towards these property rights associated with incentives for sustainability? Well, one strategy is through insecure and informal rights. In Mexico, as in many places, it is challenging for fishers to get secure and formal management and exclusion rights. For example, to get a concession 
which is a form of exclusive turf, uh, exclusive area to harvest. Fishers need extensive and expensive scientific documentation. And these only apply to many sedentary species. In the corridor, the fishers' rights are not secure or formal. For one thing, the fish refuges are temporary, only lasting five years. However, they are still finding incentives to engage in and invest in management. And we can hypothesize from this that in other places where the government does not have tight control of fishing, yet where it is sympathetic towards fisher participation in management, fishers may be able to appropriate insecure management rights and insecure management and exclusion rights, especially when in partnership with NGOs or other organizations. And these informal management and exclusion rights may be a first step away from open access. They may be followed up with more formal management and exclusion rights. For example, in the corridor, there is a the new fisheries management council that meets one or two times a year. So another key takeaway of this paper is about the importance of who changes property rights regimes. Often property rights are spoken of as given by the government, for example. ITQs are given to fishers or TERFs are given to fishers. Here, fishers and their NGO partners have demanded rights and informal rights may be one pathway for fishers to be the actors actively changing the property rights regime. It is precisely the fact that these management and exclusion rights are not legal that fishers can take the driver's seat. Finally, the reason that I studied property rights in the first place was that it was clear that they were perceived as the cause of most of the problems and as a major incentive to participate in designing and establishing the fish refuges in the corridor. And this suggests that property rights regime shifts, especially informal ones that go beyond the actively managed area, may be relatively invisible but important outcomes of policy interventions, including no-take zones and marine protected areas. So thank you all for coming the day before Thanksgiving. I know you have lots of demands in your time, so I appreciate everyone who's here and also virtually. Um, this is my email if you want to contact me, my website, and also Javier's website for his Coasts and Commons co-laboratory if you'd like to learn about more of our work. And I'll leave us on this slide. Or perhaps I'll, sh I'll stop sharing so you can get the... I'll stop sharing so we can have sort of a face-to-face -face discussion. Great, nice job. Sue is in like Native American. Oh, <laughs> that might have been a, a half a question. Um, Anastasia, thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. Um, there are a couple of questions here in the chat and I'll read them aloud so you don't have to, to negotiate the window. Um, so from Mark Schwartz, uh, he says, great success story for conservation, nicely done. Um, has INAPESCA done anything to prepare for evaluating future community proposed refuges? Um, okay, so there's now 40 refuges across the country. And to my understanding, INAPESCA has never established, this was, let's say, as of 2018, was the last time I talked to someone from INAPESCA. But as of then, they had 38, and there was never a formal way to <laughs> assess them. It seems that the major determinant is politics. So the only area I know of that was rejected was a large, what was considered a large no, no shrimp trawler, very large, no shrimp trawler area. And the shrimp trawlers organized against it, and Inapesca caved to their pressure and rejected it. The rest have been exactly approved in a similar process. Okay. Um, from Medina, uh, how could participation be improved at the onset? Um, what do you mean? I'll let I'll let you take that. Take that. <laughs> Thanks. Great talk. I should have said that too. Thank you. I'm sorry I entered a little late, but I think I cut most of it. Um, thanks for doing this. Yeah, I was just you know this is a common a problem that I've um, seen in the literature and we read about um, where you know you I think often and you suggested this might have been part of the driver of the problem is that you know, take in a really large area for conservation planning and then you have the 
participation of the stakeholders um, and you can't capture all the stakeholders and then people get excluded in that whole thing. And that has been observed, you know, uh, in other systems. So I was just wondering if you had any suggestions um, about how, you know, if we were starting from scratch again, you know, how would you manage the participation maybe in a different way? And it might not have a different outcome, but would you change the way they did it in the beginning? So just to clarify, you mean among the corridor fishers or you mean to include like the La Paz fishers and other actors from different areas? Yeah, like the people who ended up being excluded and, and having some of this uh, tension, um, would you have done the per stakeholder participation? Like, would you stratify by the different types of participants or would have you taken a smaller area or, you know, things like that? Uh, I think that to some extent conflict is inevitable when you're trying to like, to talk about reducing effort, right? I mean, in, in this case, the effort that the corridor fishers wanted to reduce was other people fishing there. And so there, I think that this kind of conflict was inevitable. There was an attempt by the NGO to reach out to those fishers, like um, at the beginning, like in 2009, to, they'd contacted some leaders in, that, uh, in the South and they were not interested in engaging. They didn't really believe that anything would happen, which this was the first time that anything like this had happened. So they weren't wrong um, in expecting that. So I think that to that, ex yeah, I think that, that that would have been hard to avoid. I think that an, an interesting question is all, like another interesting question related to that is like about getting the corridor fishers interested in participating because certainly, this is, I didn't really talk about this, but in the North, there was much higher participation than in the South. And this was due to a number of factors someone from the NGO had lived in the North for years and built, built a bunch of trust and relationships. And so I think that there's things that, that drive increasing participation within the communities. Um, but I think that what this network enabled was a process of learning. And there's been much higher participation in the second round in the South. Now that they've seen that something really did happen and uh, both politically, like the fact that they were ever passed and became law and they weren't just sinking their energy into something that would never, you know, result in anything. But also they're seeing some small, you know, ecological, you know, significant but small ecological benefits and they're starting to trust in the process a little bit more. Um, and so I've been thinking about participation as a feedback loop. And so it's this tiny, small trust building in the beginning that kind of like snowballs and increases. That being said, Yes, I think that you can't involve everybody and you have to make choices. Those are questions for political ecologists. Thanks. Thank you, Dina, that's a great question. Okay, from Michelle, how is monitoring supported in the refuges? Financially? Is Michelle there? No, I was more wanting to see how the feedback of the results of the monitoring supports the refuges and whatever rules are in them. Yeah. Um, so the monitoring is conducted by Nipraha and the fishers. So Nipraha has trained a bunch of fishers to do this kind of like traditional ecological transects, counting fish um, type monitoring, as well as they have a parallel effort um, where they, they, they pay fishers basically to collect data about their catches. And this is creating catch dependent data. The official statistics are super bad. So that you really can't learn anything from the official statistics, but they've done this kind of non-official catch statistics to try to detect whether there's any effect. And they've noticed in both the fisheries dependent and the fisheries independent data, um, they've noticed trends. Nipraha then summarizes these, makes nice graphs, pays, quantitative people to analyze the data, um, but how does it feed back into the process? Well, the process, the fishers design the areas. And so it's however they choose to interpret the data. And um, I've actually uh, conducted some interviews about this and the, the knowledge that goes into the process, at least for this first time step, you know, 2012 was the first ones, 2017 was the renewal. In that renewal, what spoke much more to the fishers was not the graphs and the, like, the significant changes that were presented to them by Nipraha, who they see as having an interest. Even if they do partner with them, they still see them as having an interest. 
Um, but what they really cited in the reason why, for example, in the North, why they expanded that area was that they, the fishers, they had a bunch of fishers from that most Northern town that conducted the monitoring. And they'd come back and they'd say, yes, there's tons of fish in this area. I'm seeing a huge change. And those kind of like informal reports were far greater in predicting, in, they, they were much more salient for the fishers and why they decided to, to change the area. That being said, the, the data, I mentioned that justification document, the data and the fact that there is data to support the fish refuges has been helpful. Ina Pesca has cited that as a reason why they expanded them. Like, they're like, yes, look, the data, the data support this and that's why we're supporting it. But the fishers didn't use that to make the decisions. They just used this more informal way or they'd go, I'd say there's three mechanisms. They'd go around and they'd like throw bait into the, they'd pass over the fish refuge, throw in bait and see how many fish came up. So they would kind of a direct way to measure it. I could go on, but I'll stop there. But that's a good question. Okay, sorry. Uh, there's another one from Dan who says, great talk. Thank you. Do you have a feeling for how easily informal property rights can evolve when some of the Ostrom characteristics are missing or different? such as more concentrated, highly seasonal, higher value, and highly vulnerable resources, like, uh, like in fish spawning aggregations? That's a super interesting question. And if you're interested in pursuing that, we should talk. Because <laughs> that, I, I don't have a sense of that. Um, this is one case. And they're, I mean, they have multiple species there. A lot of them are kind of migratory. They're really not your ideal, <laughs> they're not the ideal species um, in some ways or yeah. We should talk if you're interested in pursuing that question. I would be interested in looking at a more quantitative, broader, comparative study. I have a um, kind of a, oh, Mark, Mark popped up another a follow up question, um, but I'm going to jump in really quick uh, related to, to Dan's question. So I, I'm curious if, if insecure and informal property rights are really important to the system and to kind of the emergence of, of, uh, of the management regime, um, are, there, are there risks if these don't transition into something more concrete or more formal? Or, or could you see a system where there's this kind of constant flexibility and sort of uh, opportunity for innovation um, such as it is now? Like, is there, is, is there a necessary transition that must happen to formalize the rights um, or, or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I would wanna follow this example and, and answer that empirically, but I'd say what my best guess is, is that, I mean, that, like in security, right, comes at it, it's hard, if you have security, it's harder to have change. And so if you're trying to change the property rights, I think that insecurity is a, is a way that you can move in toward, like move towards a different system. Once you're in a more desirable system, whatever that might be for your different actors, whoever perceives it, you know, whoever's interested in the system. It, I think that if they want it to stay, the, let's say you get to a point where they kind of have the rights they want, they would want to formalize those rights. And that might be a slow process, but I think that would help you stay in that system that you prefer. Otherwise you could easily transfer, you know, transition out of it. That would be my best guess. And they are, they're trying, there are discussions of the potential for concessions, these exclusive harvest rights in the corridor. Um, it would be unprecedented with a mobile species like fish. That's the way the fin fish is the way the permits managed. But, um, but yeah, they're, they're interested in those more secure and formal rights. And those would be enabled precisely because of the collaboration between Niparaha and the fishers they can fund things like scientific studies, which the fishers on their own never could have been able to do. Okay, thanks. And, and Mark, again, sorry for jumping in. I might've made your question a little less clear. So if you need to jump in and clarify, please do. Uh, but, but Mark says, kind of following on what we were just talking about, when there isn't the convenient condition of a single community with a well-defined resource area, um, where a single cohesive community can exercise authority? Yeah, so I sort of truncated that, but uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> the papers that I've read on this, 
all seem to have this this idea that success is much easier when you have a, you know a reef on an island with a community and so that the the resource matches the community whereas in your condition you have these multiple communities along a coast and overlapping locations which increases the complexity and the difficulty quite a lot and so i was wondering if you could speak to that issue specifically thanks yeah. um okay so first of all the corridor which is what i've been referring to this whole time and i've been calling them corridor fishers that concept was invented by Niparaha. um the idea that that was a cohesive body and so i think that like what is a community is not a given it's established and created and performed and so like it's a bunch of different communities in the north they have Aguerde, you know and let's say historically these communities did have some more things in common than than they did with outsiders but there's towns that are ostensibly look very similar just to the north and just to the south but what you know these guys have Pescarabien and like the next town up north has a pretty different vision of what they use a lot more nets they use a lot more diving um and so you know i think there's there is a reason why these were selected. But I think that the narrative of El Corredor, like that being a thing, has helped them develop a common identity and develop this common problem solving. And so I think, I mean, what is a single, no community is cohesive. I mean, there's a town of 20 people in the Corredor where you have two families who hardly speak. I mean, you know, like what, I think that often our perceptions, especially as outsiders um, about what, makes it easy to do collective action might limit our ability to expand to, to think about collective action right like if we think about it, it's only possible to cohesive community we might not see that the fact is that there's many of these communities that are not actually cohesive that are still successfully managing the resources and so in this case i think that in the south where there's a lot of different towns and overlap there are more conflicts about the fish refuges but a lot of those have to do with like tight family ties, you know, they're, they're very connected. Um, and so this is all kind of dancing around your question to say, oh, I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that not having a single community is necessarily limiting. I don't think that having a single community is necessarily enabling. I think that narratives of, of community um, and how together or cohesive a group is are helpful. I think that's a great answer, and it's actually a very hopeful one, isn't it? That that communities are created, and so it's the idea that you could come into some place that lacks a cohesiveness and and maybe establish it. So, thank you. That's great. I'm an optimist, so you should take all this <laughs> with a grain of salt. Dan jumped in with another comment and just said um, he agrees. And great point about uh, how communities. Uh, can be constructed. And I think we're approaching the end of the hour. Um, Mark gives me a thumbs up, so that's a yes. Um, so probably on behalf of everybody, I just want to say thanks, Anastasia. That was a fantastic talk. Um, really appreciate you, uh, you sharing the, the research. And I hope everyone has a wonderful fall break, uh, if that's what we're leading up to, uh, or otherwise rest of your evening and rest of the week. Um, and Mark, I'm gonna remind you to, to press uh, stop recording and uh, 